Um, we're going to continue to dive in into um, uh, this uh, open banking track today. Um, by uh, we called it, we we'll call the next track managing risk ecosystem use case in open banking. And uh, what better way to uh, uh, kickstart this track with uh, Jamie McGregor from uh, the ID company. Uh, Jamie was told, telling me earlier today that they actually started talking about open banking even before the word was uh, a buzzword. So, um, warm welcome to Jamie and, uh, and um, let's uh, continue to uh, 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 this uh, track uh, today. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Rumors cleared out a little bit. I guess the technical tracks are a bit more interesting. Um, as Marcel was saying, the, the IDCO, we've been around for about 10 years. We started as a company called Money Dashboard, it's PFM, and then we broke out. And we were one of the founders of uh, FDATA and the open banking um, team. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at open banking. When we started talking about open banking in UK, first of all, people would look at us very strangely and usually send us out the door. And the first real customers we found were in the US. Um, the US is a lot further ahead from the use of bank data than Europe and UK was at that point, but they're starting to catch up. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about creating value in the next stages of open banking. So we've talked about this a couple of times today around where is open banking at the moment? So in 2013, PSD2 proposals were first released. You know, open banking world was created in 2015. Open Banking APIs launched in 2017 in UK across the CMA9. And then the uh, PSD2 RTS was in September this year. And then we have a whole bunch of new countries appearing on the market. We've heard about New Zealand, Australia looking at open banking, Hong Kong. Hong Kong can be a very strange one with how their open banking is going to compete with the um, Chinese regulation that's put into uh, Hong Kong as well. South Africa have, looked, uh, have released an open banking white paper and so have Mexico recently. So there's a lot of changes happening within open banking at the moment and the market's really opening up currently. The market's growing. You know, there's lots and lots of people coming into the market. We're seeing lots and lots of competitors suddenly appearing and we're seeing lots and lots of people suddenly bringing out open banking products. The aggregation market is really starting to grow, but it's also coming to a point where it's going to start collapsing on itself again. And we reckon within the next um, six to 18 months, we're going to start seeing a consolidation of that market. What does that mean? Well, what we're going to see is those big players, the plaids, the tinks, the yodelies of this world, they're out there cornering their market. They're giving data away free. So that's commoditizing the cost of data. So where do we go from here if data is being commoditized? The average price per transaction is dropping. Two years ago, you were looking at maybe a um, dollar per transaction. That's now dropping to below 20 cents per transaction nowadays when you talk to the big aggregators. If you go to Tink, you get all that data free. If the data's free, where does the value come from? We all know, and we've heard these comments a couple of times, that data is our new oil. If anyone's seen oil as a raw product, it's blacky brown, sticky and horrible. It gets them out of the ground, it's not very useful. If you chucked it in your car, your car would stop very quickly. If you used it for anything at that point, it's absolutely useless. But when you refine it and you frack it down into the areas we need it to produce the chemicals we need to produce uh, plastics and produce all the other petrochemical devices we have, it becomes valuable. So there is no value in the data unless we prove there's value in it. 
So how do we prove the value in that data? There's a couple of key use cases I'm going to talk about. And the first one's going to be around KYC. Know your customer. This is one of the biggest ones we've been talking about with most of our people in the, around, is what is know your customer? How do we do it? So account verification, very, very simple. As an AISP, you can go in and you can make sure the account the person's telling you is, is their account. Identification becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, in Open Banking Spec version 3, which has just been released, account holder name is one of those key pieces within it. Anyone here work as an AISP or have looked at the account, uh, the Open Banking version 3 specs? There's a lovely piece in it that says that the account holder name must be produced as per a previous channel. So that means that as a bank, if I've used account holder name and I've used it as a nickname or a um, generic name that the user can change, so you can change it to my slush fund or change it to Nick or to Brian or whatever you want, that's the name they have to produce for account holder name, which becomes absolutely useless in a KYC situation. So if I was looking at my account and saying, Jamie McGregor is my name and this is my account, and I've named that account joint account or something else, that's what the bank has to push out. So there are difficulties there. KYC can also be used around fraud and fraud detection. We've been working with one of the largest uh, rideshare apps in the world, um, looking at how we... Um, how they onboard their customers and how they onboard their drivers and looking at how they manage that process. And a couple of things have fallen out of that. One of them um, was around a number of drivers were all paying into the same account, which none of them owned. So you had 10 or 15 drivers were all paying into a single bank account, which none of those drivers owned. Now, is that fraud? Or was that some kind of modern slavery? We're unsure, and without investigation from the company, we can't tell you what that is. But there's ways we can find those things using um, bank data. Categorization. Categorization is a funny little piece. It sounds really easy. If you look at your bank statement, you can see where you've shopped. You can see Costco. You can see um, Starbucks. You can see Amazon. But if you look closely, you'll see that each one of those names is slightly different. That each merchant might produce Amazon in a different way, or each bank might produce Amazon in a different way. You might have AMZ MKT for Amazon Marketplace. You might have a payment to Amazon through another source. And trying to recognize all these different things to categorize them and make sure you get it accurate is very important. Categorization helps you do things like push in the standard financial statements. So making sure that you've got all the information there. Spend analysis. Where are you spending your money? Funny thing is, when we um, trial this with customers and they think, oh, this is great, I'll put in my bank account and I'll see what my spend is, and they suddenly go, oh, I didn't realize I spent 80 pound a week in um, Starbucks and things like this. It becomes very quickly um, obvious where you're spending your money when you look at categorization and spend analysis. Categorization is a very simple beast to do but becomes very complex to do it accurately and to do it consistently. There's two versions you can use. You can have lookup tables, which become static, and will provide you with all those merchant names, etc. And your system will look those, look those up and go, yep, this is Amazon, therefore it's online retail. But those become static and they become out of date and they move very quickly. Machine learning gives you the advantage where it's not static. But machine learning has an issue where it can't recognize everything. 
and it gets confused very quickly, especially around things like Apple Payments. Now, an Apple Payment is not a payment to Apple. It's an Apple Payment to something else. Machine learning finds it very difficult to recognize that something else. You could use merchant, the um, bank merchant codes. They're really good. Um, within version two of uh, open banking standards, merchant codes were released, but not every bank has to release them. They're an optional feature. Also, not every bank has the same merchant codes. So how do you then get the proprietary merchant codes from different banks? You need categorization up to about 95% accuracy for other functions to work because they use the categorization models to then produce other pieces. In particular, things like asset verification um, and credit and risk analysis. Income verification. Another really simple feature that you can get very quickly out of open banking. The big question is, what is income? Is income a payment from a, an employer into your account? Is income a pension? Is income rental money that you get from a suite of rental pro properties that you own? Income is all these things and much, much more. Income could be child support payments you get from, a, from, a, from an ex-partner. They could be things like um, uh, Department of Welfare and Social Security payments. Your customers define what they believe income is. And you have to be able to identify that within the open banking data. When you take that as a whole, if you take someone's bank account and you take their primary account, on average there will be 500 transactions per month in that account. Using the uh, consent model we currently have with the 90-day consent window, you can pull down 15 months of data. So you can take the first, as you go in for the first poll, you can pull a year's amount of data, and then three months beyond that for the 90-day um, reauthentication. Once you've done that, you've got 15 months. So that gives you, on average, about 7,000 transactions. <laughs> We currently are doing between 80 to 90,000 customer applications a month, which means we're getting between um, four and eight million transactions every month. Within all of those, we've got to find out where is the uh, income amount within there and how do we identify that and how do we make sure that we are identifying the right things and then tailor that to each of the customers that are involved. And it becomes very complex very quickly. Once you've done income, that leads into other features, like asset verification. Once you know how much someone's earning, you can then look at how much they're spending and how much they've got from an asset perspective, and you can then put a whole picture of what that person looks like. Categorization and income are your two basic value-add opportunities that you have within open banking. As we get into more complex ones, we can look at credit. What is credit? How do we manage credit? And how do we then analyze people for credit worthiness? From our perspective as a company, as the IDCO, we want to reduce the reliance on credit risk or credit reference agencies, the experience in this world, and people like that. We believe the way they do credit is wrong. We believe that if you've got a credit rating of five or 600, and you're being analyzed on that, what does that mean? And if you've got a 900, what does that mean? Well, if any, any of us have a credit card and we pay it off every month, 
your credit rating is going to be actually around the six, 700 mark. Because the bank isn't going to make that much money from you. Because if you pay your credit card off every month, there is no interest involved. And therefore, the credit card agency and the bank aren't making money from you. If you start paying off just the interest, after a couple of months, you'll get a nice letter from the uh, credit card agency saying, we've upped your limit. And then if you went and rechecked your credit score, your credit score would have gone up as well. Now, is that feeding the wrong behaviours? I'm not sure, but I personally believe that is. Credit worthiness shouldn't be assessed on how much the bank can make from you. It should be assessed on what actually your credit worthiness is. How can you control your money? Do you get return direct debits? Do you do gambling? All these factors that go into what makes you credit worthy. Also in that is looking at not just how credit worthy you are, but should the bank lend to you? And what does that mean? So looking more at the credit risk. Looking at debt management and trying to look a bit more at the ethical side of finance and saying, once someone's in a debt position, how do we help them move from that? How do we stop things like loan stacking? How do we make sure that people are put who are in vulnerable positions are not pushed further and further into debt. All these features are great, but they lead into products that we can then sell to customers. Fraud detection analysis. Is this bank account being accessed by an area which we know that fraud comes from? Are multiple people paying into the same accounts? Is the account being used in peaks and troughs? As in there's no money in the account, then suddenly there's large amounts of money being paid into the account, and that goes out very quickly. Thin credit file analysis. I don't know how many of you travel, but I moved back to UK three years ago from living in Singapore for 13 years. I went to the bank. Um, which I've had an account with for 25 years, and said I need a mortgage. And they said no, because I had no credit, because I had no credit reference. Yet I could turn around them and give them access to my Singapore bank account, showing that I paid rent every month, that my income was a set value, that I had incoming money into my account that was more than enough to pay off a mortgage at that time. Still, I was forced to put a 30% deposit down as a minimum to try and get a mortgage. With the mobility around the world, we're seeing more and more of this where people are coming in and asking for credit within credit files. How can we make it better to give those people credit and bring them more into that area? Also, people in the gig economy, which is becoming more and more prevalent now, how do we make sure that they have access to credit when they need it? InsureTech is another thing that's going to be talked about later today. But with these features, we can start looking at how InsureTech is involved in this and how open banking can support that. Government policy planning. We've been working with the Scottish government recently around looking at how costs are allocated around the country and how um, people in vulnerable positions, how their costs are allocated and how that's managed. Looking at how we go to maybe a better system than universal credit, and how we go into a more equitable position in the future. Payment services. This is a big one which is coming on the horizon now. We're working with a company called Modular, who are a PISP, and looking at how we can then leverage those payment services on top of the other products we're already doing. Identification services, KYC, and ethical finance products. When to give finance and when not to give finance. 
And we personally believe the when not to give finance is more important than the when to give finance. We see a lot of people putting themselves into debt positions and that needs to be managed and it needs to be done in a more ethical way within our, within our environment and ecosystem. So what's the elephant in the room around all this? What problems are we seeing and how are we addressing them? We have all the data in the world. Uh, last count, we have just over 200 million transactions from a UK perspective and just under half a billion transactions from a US perspective. But looking at all that data is great. Makes your mind go very funny very quickly. But we already know machine learning isn't the full answer. You've just got to look at the algorithms that have been put in place recently. Apple have, Apple have turned around and been accused of being sexist against their female um, card owners, where they're um, getting a less, lesser value of credit than their uh, male counterparts. We're seeing lots of problems around algorithms. Um, when you look at the, bias, in the unintentional bias that's being put into these algorithms, by the data that's being pushed into them. And we need to be aware of that whenever we're using machine learning. Screen scraping versus open banking. I'm going to say something very controversial here. Screen scraping currently gives us more data than open banking. Either the specs haven't been followed as much as they should have, or we're getting information back which is actually useless in the, in the way it's being presented to us. Customer trust. Everyone's talked about climate change versus global warming. Now, global warming, we can all turn around and say, doesn't exist because actually some places are getting cooler, some places are getting hotter. But climate change, we all agree, does exist. The same nomenclature is the problem with an open banking. No one wants their bank to be open. They want their bank to be shut, nice and tight, and no one can get at their money. So when you talk to the front-end clients about open banking, there's a customer mistrust there. To give you an idea of what that looks like at the moment, this is from the uh, Financial Times on the anniversary of the, um, or oh, sorry, the beginning of uh, PSD2, they were expecting 33 million customers by 2022. At the moment, after the first 18 months of open banking, we have less than 5 million. So we need a significant growth before we get up to those numbers that we were expecting. Lack of knowledge in the market. Our sales team are consultative sales. We're in a position where we're still having to educate customers around what is open banking, how it can affect them, and what the advantages to them using open banking are. In the banks, there's still a lot of misunderstanding of open banking as well. We were invited to go and talk to 450 um, PSD2 people for one of the CMA9 banks. Now, these people have been working for two years on PSD2. They were all ready to launch, and we were there just to talk a bit more about PSD2 and give them a bit of a rah-rah you know, speech before they went forward into the, into the trenches to start really pushing out PSD2 before the launch. In that, the credit risk officer stood up at the front of the meeting and said, who here thinks open banking is a good thing? and maybe a third of their hands went up. He said, who thinks it's a bad thing? And two thirds of their hands went up. Now this is the group that have spent about three quarters of a billion dollars on PSD2, and they still think that open banking was a bad thing. And when the straw, straw poll was done, the question was, why is it a bad thing? And they all turned around and said, well, we're giving our data away for free. At which stage said, we are totally agree on that. We are giving our data away for free. But we've also got access to everyone else's data for free as well. 
So we just haven't got our data, we've got everyone else's data. And there's a misunderstanding there within the market about what the data is and how you get it. From an EU perspective, the launch has not been effective. This is a slide I took from Tink um, that came out just for PSD2. As you can see from a um, PSD2 perspective, Europe were not ready. And we're seeing that more and more as we go out to customers and try and connect to bank APIs. Sandboxes may be there, but actually operationally, they don't have those systems in place. Apart from all that, the future is bright. Customers want faster decisions, and they're willing to give up the data to get them. We're seeing that more and more that customers want decisions today. They don't want to wait two weeks for a decision. They want it today. And they, to enable that, and you turn around and say, you have to give us access to your data, they're willing to do that. Banks and businesses are getting on board the train. They are coming forward. They are getting into the point where they are accepting open bank data and seeing what it can do for them. If you find the value in the data, you'll find the customers. And it's very quick and easy to do that. The UK is in a great place at the moment. We were ahead of the curve with open banking, and we're continually being ahead of the curve with that. We're leading the rest of the world in something which is going to change the world in a huge way. When the um, lady was up speaking about New Zealand, they've used our standards. And that's what we're seeing across the world, is people are looking at the UK as that shining beacon of open banking. And we're there right at the forefront and leading it forward. And that's it from me. A minute and 30 over. Damn. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? We have time for two questions. Raise your hand. And by the way, no technical questions. I stopped coding about 20 years ago. Thanks. Um, just interested in what are the biggest difference, uh, the differences that you see between the data available in screen scraping and and open banking, and have you fed that back in you know, to people like Chris earlier on, because you could probably produce a stack load of data around that, demonstrating why one's currently richer than the other, but just interested in the main differences that you've seen. The main difference is, well, there's, there's two differences. So from an API perspective, data quality is 100%. Uh, within screen scraping, data quality can be as low as 95%, which is okay, but not brilliant. But the value add data that you get on top of that, account holder name, account holder address, those type of things, become more critical when you start moving into the value add features. So it's not that you get cleaner data, but you get richer data at the moment from screen scraping, because within open banking, the speci specifications haven't really been followed as we would like. Yes, we are feeding that back to the OBIE. We are feeding that back through FData as well to try and pull that together. Um, but this is where we get into that whole regulated issue of the banks have a say in the regulation, and therefore they want the regulation to be as non-onerous to them to implement as possible. Second question. Okay, question to all of you. Who thinks open banking is a good thing? Are you willing to give up your banking information to everyone out there? Everyone. Everyone. Well, everyone who asks for it. Well, there, there is a problem within open banking. 
And it's a problem below the surface, which a lot of people aren't really looking at at the moment. You share your data with me, and you sign that agreement saying you're willing to share that data with me. And within that, there's a clause which says, I can then share your data onwards. You no longer control that data from the moment you share it with me to who I share it with beyond that. That's a very big issue. And it's an issue that we, as a forum, need to address um, within the OBIE, within FDATA, looking at how we make sure that we as consumers still own the data and still control where that data goes. And it's not the first party sharing, it's the third, fourth, fifth party sharing that sits below that. If I share my data with you and then withdraw consent, um, there's nothing that says that you need to destroy the historic data that you held. Correct. And isn't that a little It's bit not until you come back to us and tell us to remove that data that we have to remove that data. And that's as per GDPR. Okay. Is that so, yes, that you can remove your consent, which means we can no longer take any further data. But until you tell us to remove the data, we can still hold that data, yes. Thank you. Thank you.